all you big, beautiful brains out there. Today, we're going to talk about hypnotism. Before we get started, take a minute to subscribe to Psy vs. Psy. Help out your friendly neighborhood psychologist while I tell you all about hypnotism. Near where I live, there's a small town that has a festival every year that features a hypnotist. I have seen that hypnotist convince people that they had a baby on stage. <laughs> I've seen him convince that same person that their baby was named Baby Shark. <laughs> and possibly most impressive of all, I once saw that hypnotist convince a person that they were Lady Gaga. Not only was he the best Lady Gaga impersonator I've ever seen, but his scissor splits were particularly impressive. You've probably seen hypnotists too, whether it's in person or on TV or even in the wonderful cosmic void that is YouTube. <laughs> Hypnotism is something most people have an opinion on. And those opinions fall all along this spectrum from absolutely you can be hypnotized to there's no way that anyone could ever convince my incredible brain to be hypnotized. So that brings us to the big question. Is hypnotism real? Short answer is yeah. <laughs> but probably a more accurate answer is yes, but not in the way that you typically think about being hypnotized. <coughs> hypnotism is one of the states of consciousness. When you're hypnotized, you are just in a different state of awareness about yourself and your actions than you are regularly. Let's talk about the two big ways that hypnotism is different than your normal state of consciousness. The first way hypnotism is different than your typical state of consciousness is that we're paying attention to things that are different. We've talked about what consciousness is in another video, so we won't get too much into it here, but one part of consciousness deals with being aware of our inner thoughts. When you are hypnotized, or as psychologists would say, when you're in a hypnotic state, you are extremely focused on these inner thoughts. Basically, you become so absorbed in yourself and what you are thinking and what you are feeling that the outside world kind of melts away. This change in consciousness can actually be observed in your brain. We can tell by looking at your brain activity that a certain part of your brain, called the dorsal anterior cingulate, decreases in activity. That part of your brain is heavily involved in what we call your brain's salience network. Basically, how your brain decides what's important to pay attention to. Your brain is focusing on just these inner thoughts and stops paying attention to most everything else. People who have been hypnotized report only really paying attention to maybe one or two things in the outside world. For instance, the voice of the person who's hypnotizing them. Listen only to the sound of my voice, right? The second big thing that makes being in a hypnotic state different than your normal state of consciousness is that you seem to perceive your own actions a little bit differently. When you're in a hypnotic state, there's a disconnect in your brain between the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and areas like the posterior cingulate cortex and medial prefrontal cortex. So the areas of your brain that control actions separates from the area that controls your awareness of your actions. For example, let's go back to that person from the top of the video whom the hypnotist may think they had a baby. On stage, the hypnotist handed the baby to the lady and told her she had a baby. Now, obviously, making the decision to be responsible for having and raising a baby is something that takes days, <laughs> months. I mean, it takes a long time. 
it's painful. It's stressful. It's certainly not something that somebody can just hand you a baby and say, here, take care of this tiny human, like forever. That's not a thing most people would be okay with. But because that separation of being hypnotized was going on her brain, she just accepted. Well, of course, that's her baby. Now, here's where we get to the part about hypnotism is different than you might think. For starters, just because that separation between controlling your actions and awareness of your actions separates, doesn't mean that it's non-existent. You are still in control of yourself. You won't do anything when you're hypnotized that you wouldn't or couldn't do when you're not hypnotized, which makes that Gaga impersonation all the more impressive. In movies and on TV, you see people that can be forced into doing terrible things like committing murders when they're hypnotized. That just doesn't happen. Remember, people are listening intensely to their own thoughts, to their own feelings. The hypnotist can't force you to do something you don't want to do because you're so aware of your own thoughts and feelings. Where this line gets a little fuzzy is that given enough time and energy and probably money, the person who is hypnotizing you could convince you that the outside conditions that exist aren't really true. Uh, in a lot of these movies, the people trying to convince you to do these bad things are places like secret shadow government organizations. But I mean, that's kind of ridiculous, right? I mean, like convincing a whole secret ops team of super fighters that they were the only hope for saving the world. It would take years and millions of dollars to develop the technology to be able to convince someone of that. And why would the government... I kind of want, want to see that movie now. But anyway, another way that hypnosis is different is that what you start thinking about hypnosis, you tend to not think about it as you are or you aren't, right? People seem to vary in how susceptible they are to being hypnotized. You can be more or less hypnotized. This seems to follow a normal curve of distribution. The average person will have the average level of susceptibility, and you'll have an equal amount of people on each side of that curve that are either really likely to be hypnotized or not likely at all to be hypnotized. Ever seen people being hypnotized on stage and there are just some people who are like, yeah, I'm totally not hypnotized. Those people are going to fall into that I'm not very likely to be hypnotized percentage of the population. Strangely enough, there actually doesn't seem to be any relationship in believing in hypnotism and your ability to be hypnotized. Believing in hypnotism doesn't make you more likely to be able to be hypnotized, just like not believing in hypnotism doesn't make it less likely that you'll be hypnotized. Now, here's where hypnosis gets kind of scary. You can use hypnosis to create something called false memories. False memories like fake memories. As in a hypnotist can actually put memories into your brain. Now, false memories can be made in all kinds of ways. In fact, one of my very favorite psychologists, Elizabeth Loftus, once did a study where people were convinced that they'd seen Bugs Bunny at Disney World after just showing them an ad to come meet Bugs Bunny at Disney World. Now, this could never have happened because Bugs Bunny is owned by Warner Brothers and not Disney, at least not by Disney yet, but people said they remembered meeting Bugs at Disney, and that was after just being shown an ad. Chances are we all have false memories or fake memories, whether it's from being told stories about us when we were little that didn't really happen, or being shown photoshopped pictures of someone and then remembering them looking like that the last time you saw them. But false memories, when they are put there under hypnosis, can be really, really dangerous. Implanting false memories during hypnosis is a thing we didn't really know about until the 1980s. Until then, people thought that hypnosis could help us only uncover 
repressed memories. Uh, repressed memories being things people don't want to remember, like for instance, sexual abuse. But instead of recovering these repressed memories, they were actually implanting false memories. This is called false memory syndrome. And a lot of malpractice cases were filed and won. It's still something that is a major topic in the clinical hypnotherapy community all these years later. The good news is there is a professional division of the American Psychological Association that is exclusively dedicated to studying hypnosis. It's Division 30, the Society of Psychological Hypnosis. There are researchers who study hypnosis and its effects on the behavior in your brain. There are clinical hypnotherapists who specialized in applied hypnosis with their patients. And here's one of the really important things. Being trained in hypnotherapy means that you are a trained hypnosis therapeutic techniques, right? You spend years in a doctoral program studying therapy. They are therapists. Think of it like how a cardiovascular surgeon has to spend years training and studying to be a doctor and a surgeon, and then they can specialize in the heart. They spend years studying and training to be a therapist first, and then they learn about hypnosis. You do not become a licensed clinical hypnotherapist without years of study and dedication to the field. That means if your coworker or your friend or your aunt takes a weekend seminar in hypnosis and then offers to hypnotize you, keep in mind that that weekend certification does not make them a scientist nor a trained hypnotherapist. If you wanna know more about some of the other states of consciousness, including answering that basic question, what is consciousness? Make sure you subscribe to Psy vs. Psy so you can get all of our other videos and you can learn all about the science of psychology. Until next time, keep thinking and I'll see y'all later. Bye! You're getting sleepy. You will subscribe to Psy vs. Psy for all our latest videos. You're hypnotized. Click the subscribe button. Yeah, this totally isn't going to work.